Today, we're going to be talking about type checking in Roblox development. And you're probably wondering, what are the benefits of type checking? Well, it makes your code much easier to understand, especially in the future when you come back to it months later. It makes your code much easier to digest by other developers. It enables auto completion, which can be extremely useful while scripting. And it also gives you a much better understanding of what you're doing and realizing what you're actually working with. Type checking is really simple and easy to work with. And hopefully by the end of this video, you'll start implementing it into your code. Now, if you guys do enjoy the video, make sure you smash the like button, also subscribe button, and turn this post notification on if you want to get notified when I upload more Roblox development content. Additionally, I have a Patreon if you guys like to support me and gain access to a ton of scripts and game files that I've made in my past videos. There's a link down below in the description and you guys can go and check that out as well. With that being said, let's get into it. So hopping directly in the studio, I already have a script opened up just so we can easily start working with different types. Now we're going to start off basic by going over most of the different types that are currently available in Roblox. So there are eight primitive types that we can use, but we're going to be going over the five that you're most likely ever going to use while developing on Roblox. The first one is nil which basically equates to nothing. The next one that we have is a string, which is basically a word or character surrounded in quotation marks. Then we have number, which is a literal number. Then we have the Boolean, which could either be true or false. And then we have table, which obviously can be a table. Now, Roblox has a wide variety of different types that are specific to Roblox that they allow us to use. Some of the most common types that Roblox offers is the player type. And we commonly get player objects by using the player service. Sometimes we'll want to loop through all of the players. And then every time we loop through a player, we will be getting a player object object, which is also a type. Additionally, another very common type that you all should know is that inside of our workspace, right now we have a part called base plate. And if we set the base plate part to a variable, well, that variable now has a type of part. And if we create a random model and put that inside of our workspace and set that to a variable, then what would the type be of that variable? Well, of course, it would be of the model type because it is a model object. Now, Roblox has a wide variety of different types, and we just covered some of the most commonly used types. If you want to see all the different types that Roblox offers, there's a nice documentation page which covers all this and there's a link to this page down below in the description now the next thing we should talk about is type inferencing when we created this player variable right here and we set it to players we loop through all the players and got the first player that's currently in our game roblox studio knows by default that the get players method will return a bunch of different players in an array and then when we get the first player in that array that will be a player object so when we set the variable to this roblox studio knows that this variable will be of the type of a player and we can confirm this because when we type out player we can see right here here to the right of it, it says player indicating the type of this variable. So then when we type out the variable name and then put a period there, we can see a bunch of different properties and events that we can use because all of these are of the specific player type. And let's just say that we wanted to get the user ID. Now Roblox has some documentation right here, which tells us what the user ID actually is. We can see the type of it, which is a number. And let's just say that we wanted to set the user ID to something which we never would actually do. But I'm just showing you since Roblox Studio inferred that this variable right here is of the type player, we then have access to all of the different properties and events and functions that come along with it. The same goes with part. If we have this part variable right here, Roblox can infer that it is a part because the variable is set to a part object. So when we use the part variable, we can say part dot, and now all these different properties, events, and functions come up that we can modify, and all these are specific to the part type. So let's say, for instance, we want to modify the brick color property of this specific part. Since Roblox Studio is able to infer that this was of the part type, we now have auto completion, which makes it much easier easier for us to work with this specific object because we now know all the properties, events, and functions that we actually have access to. The next thing that we want to know is how do we actually enable type check? Currently, there's three levels of type checking. We have no check, non-strict, and strict. The default mode that we're in is non-strict. Now, the way that we can actually change the mode is by going to the top of our script and adding a comment here. Then once we put the two lines to initiate the comment, we want to use an exclamation mark, and then we can say either no check, and then we can say either no check, non-strict, which would be pointless because Roblox Studio is automatically in this mode, or we can say strict. And now this will indicate the mode of type check. And I would recommend putting in a strict while you're learning how to do type checking so that you can see your errors and learn a little bit easier. Now, what we want to learn is how to specify the type of a variable or even the arguments inside of a function. It's really easy to do this. And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new variable. We're going to say local test, and then we're going to use a semicolon. And now after the semicolon, we can actually indicate what the type of this variable is going to be. If we wanted to, we could say player, but then we need to make sure that we actually set this variable to a player. Since this is for 
for testing purposes, I'm going to say that this variable is equal to a number, and then I'm going to set it to 10. Now, this is pretty pointless because Roblox Studio already infers that this variable is going to be of the type number because 10 is a number. So we don't actually have to put that there, but this is just an example. Now, where this becomes more useful at is if we create a function and we want to specify the type of those arguments. So we can say test two to create a random function. And let's say that this function is going to accept a player and we want this specific argument to be of the type player. So now whenever we call this function, it's going to say that the first argument is going to need to be a player. So now we always have to pass through a player to this function. Otherwise, we're going to have an error. Like let's say, for instance, we try to pass one. We now see that there's a red underline on this because type number cannot be converted into player. Now, another example of this would be, let's say that we want to add another argument to this and we maybe want to modify the player's data, for instance. So we want to get the player and then we also want to get the amount, which is going to be a number by how much we want to modify the player's data by. And now, of course, whenever we call this function, what we need to do is we need to pass through a player and a number. Otherwise, we're going to have issues. And of course, this is going to throw a red underline because we don't actually have the player variable. But this is, of course, just for an example. So now that we know how to use type annotation to specify the type of a variable or function arguments, let's learn about optional parameters when it comes to functions. So imagine if we create a function called rename player. And of course, what would this accept? Well, it would accept a player object and then would also accept some sort of name, which would be a string that we want to set the player's name to. And this function would most likely set the name of the player to the name that we just provided. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to modify the name property of the player to a brand new name that we just specified. Now, let's think about this function for a second. What if we wanted to have a name by default so that when we call this function, we didn't always have to pass through a name. And what I mean by that is let's call this function rename player, just pass through a player, and then we can just pass through a name like test. But what if we just wanted to call this function and sometimes we didn't actually want to have to pass through another name. We just wanted to have a name in the function by default. And if we wanted to, we could also pass through a name as well, but we don't always need to. Well, what we could do is we could create a name by default. So what we can do is we can say name equals name. And what this is going to do is if the name doesn't equal nil, the name is just going to equal name. It's not going to change anything. But then we can say or and then we can pass through our default name. So if we call this function and we don't pass through the name argument, then this name variable is going to be set to default. But if we do pass through the name as an argument, the name will still be set to the same name and that will not change the default. And the last thing that we need to do to make this argument optional is put a question mark where we actually specify the type of name. So now that we have a question mark here, whenever we call this function, we don't actually have to provide a second argument in the function call because name is now optional. Now, the only thing is, is that this is going to display an error when we try to change this property. And the reason for that is because when we actually set the default value, Roblox Studio isn't smart enough to infer that name is going to be a string because it will always at least be a string. Even if we don't provide it a string as the argument, it will always be set to a string because we do that right here. So considering how we have the setup currently, this error could be ignored. But if you don't want to ignore the error, the right thing to do would actually be using type refinement. And what type refinement is, is we can say if name then. And now what this is doing is confirming that name is not nil. So what we can do is we can then move player.name equals name inside of this if statement, because now we're confirming that the name does exist. So now we're able to set the player.name to the name without seeing any red underlines at all. This still would work, but you are going to have that red underline right here. So you might think that you're going to have an error, but considering how we have it set up, this will not actually give us any error at all, but we can use type refinement to guarantee that and make the error go away as well. Now let's talk about setting the return time type of a function. So imagine we had a function which was called get sum. And what this would do is it would accept two numbers. So num1, which would be a number and num2, which would also be a number. And then what this function would do is it would actually return num1 plus num2. Now, once again, using type inference, Roblox Studio is smart enough to determine that this function will return a number. But imagine we had a more complex function that might return a player or do something similar to that, that Roblox might not be able to infer. How would we guarantee or tell Roblox Studio what type this function would return? Well, it's really simple. We just have to answer annotate at the end of the function after we created the parameters and say what type it's going to return. So we put the semicolon and then we can say number because it's going to return a number or we could say player if we know that it's going to return a player, but obviously it's not going to. So we would have to say number right here. So setting the return type of the function is just as easy as setting the type of variables or parameters. Now, what are union types? Union types are really helpful because imagine you had a variable which could be multiple different types. So imagine we had a variable right here called test and by default, we set that to 10, but we 
also want to test to be able to equal a string as well. Well, how can we make this possible? Well, we have to annotate this variable and we have to say number because of course it can be equal to a number. Then we can use a vertical pipe next to that type and now we can add another type to this. So we can say string. So now test is guaranteed to be either a number or a string. But what if we also want to test to be able to equal a boolean as well, such as true? Well, all we have to do is add another pipe to this and we can say boolean. Now the same goes for function parameters as well. So if we want an example to equal either a player or a model for some reason, then all we have to do is put a pipe between those two types and now we know example could equal either of the two things. And additionally, if we wanted the function to be able to return multiple types as well, we can do the exact same thing. So we can say this function can return either a number or a boolean or anything else like that. All we have to do is add a pipe between the type and then add the brand new type. Now let's talk about singleton types, which are incredibly useful and I believe they were actually added relatively recently. Now one of the scenarios that this can come incredibly useful for that I can think of is imagine you had a shop GUI and there would be a remote function from the client to the server requesting to purchase an item. Now let's think of the different things that the server could return to the player based off their request. So let's say local result equals the first thing that could be returned from the server is purchased if they were able to successfully purchase it. Now let's annotate the type of this variable and say what the different results could actually be. So the first result is purchased. Then we will use the pipe symbol to add another type to this and we can say declined. Maybe they didn't have enough money or something and you could even instead of saying declined you could say not enough money or maybe they have a full inventory. So now we know result will equal one of these three strings. So if we try to set result again we can see that when we try to set result again we have three different options that we can actually set it to. So now this gives us so much better control and an understanding over certain variables because we know the limitations of what this variable could possibly be. Now unfortunately I was going to show you an example by using numbers but numbers are currently not supported as literal types. Hopefully in the future Roblox will improve on this and make this possible. You could use booleans for example though so if for some reason you wanted a variable which will always be set to true then you could use a singleton type and say that the type of this will always be true. I personally just find this really useful when it comes to strings. Now let's talk about creating our own custom types. It's really simple and easy to create a custom type. It's very similar to creating a variable. All we have to say is type test equals number. And now this type right here will be available for us to use in annotation. So like, let's say local test number, annotate it to the test type. And then we have to set this of course to a number. So 10, for example. And now test number is of course the type of a number, but its actual type is test. You're probably thinking, why does this matter at all? This seems really weird and I don't understand why I'd ever do it. Well, it actually becomes really useful when it comes to creating tables. So imagine we create a brand new type for our pet object that we're gonna create in our game. What we would do is we would set that to a table and now inside of the table, we could specify all the different properties and what types of those properties would be. So for example, we would have a name and the type of this would of course be a string. And we'd also have the rarity inside of here as well. And that would be a string as well. So then if we wanted to create a pet, now what we could easily do is annotate it to the type of pet, create a new table. And now inside of this table, we can see the different variables that we have. So we have name and we need to make sure that we set this to a string. So test. And then we also have the rarity as well, which is a string and now we just set this to common and there we go we've now used the pet type and we've created a pet you still might not get the full usage of this but trust me this becomes extremely useful when you're creating different tables for complex things like inventory systems boosters or things like that oh also a little bonus info you can also have optional properties so next to where we identify the type of this property we can add a question mark to this and now we don't actually have to add the rarity property when creating the pet or using the pet type anymore so now this property is optional so how do we get typed from another screen well, what I actually like to do with my games is I like to create a module script inside of the replicated storage, rename it to types, and now inside of here is where I will create all of my different types that will be shared amongst different scripts. Now let's go ahead and copy my pet type that I created in this script right here and put it inside of here. Now all we have to do to share this type amongst different scripts is use the keyword export before creating the type. So now that we say export type and then the specific type and we create the type, we can now require this module script and use it in different scripts. So let's actually require the module and use the pet type in this script from this script. All right, so now that we've required the types module script, all we have to do when we wanna use a specific type is type in types, which is the module, and then put a period. And now we can see all the different types that we can actually use. And considering there's only one type in there, we can use the pet type. And now we set this variable to the pets type, which is created inside of this module right here. Here's another example as well. Imagine that we wanted to create a specific type for our player data. So each player's data is gonna contain cash, which is gonna be a number, gems, which is gonna be a number, and then pets, which of course is gonna be a table. And inside of this 
table, there's going to be a string, and then that's going to be set to this pet type right here, which is the type that we created up here. So the pet is going to be a table, which is going to have a name and a rarity, which are both going to be strings as well. Now, since we added the export keyword before creating the type, we can go into our other script and let's just say local test and we can annotate this to types dot player data and now we can create our own player data so we have gems we can set that to 10 we have cash and then of course we can keep going on so then we have pets and we of course would set that to a table and we can keep going on from here so we're once again going to cover type refinement but just to show you in a different way of how to actually use this inside of our workspace imagine if we wanted to loop through our workspace and realistically we just want to find all the parts that are inside of our workspace so we could do something with them now of course inside of our workspace we have a bunch of other different objects inside of here as well, such as a model, a spawn location, terrain, and a camera. So when we loop through the parts and get all the different children, if we type in possible part, we won't be able to get the properties that are specific to the part because we don't know if what we're looping through right now is actually a part. So what we have to do is we have to refine this variable a little bit. And the simplest way to do that is by checking if this part right here is a, and then the type that we want. So part then, and I'm going to do this a little bit differently. So we're going to say if not, so if possible part is not a part, then what we're going to do is we're just going to continue through the loop to the next item. So anything below this line will be a guaranteed part. So now that we're guaranteed that possible part will be a part, if we check the variable, it still is just an instance. So it's still not specified as a part. And what if we try to annotate this now as a part? Well, it just doesn't work. You're not actually able to do that. Now, this is a slightly hacky solution that I've seen other developers use, which is why I'm sharing it. What I've seen people do is we can create a new variable. So we can say like local part, and then we can set that to possible part. And then what we could do is we could annotate this variable as a part. So now we are guaranteeing that possible part is a part. And now we're going to just use a new variable, which is equal to possible part as well. So it's really not different at all. You're just using a different variable. So then we can type out part. We see it is a part. And then we can also see all the properties and events that come along with a part, such as the brick color. And now we can easily have the auto completion for this as well. It is a hacky solution, but I'm simply showing you guys this because you guys might experience this in the future. And it's just a solution that the community has found. It's not the best, but it does work. Another thing is, is that you can can also annotate the key and the value in a for loop. So if we wanted to, we could say that possible part will be a part, although this will be inaccurate. But as long as we know that and we still have the check right here, guaranteeing that anything below this line will be a part, we can then say possible part and see that the type of this is a part. So of course, doing this is a little bit less accurate and it is a little bit sloppier, especially if you come back to this code after a few months, you might have to realize, oh, this variable won't always be a part. But these are two different solutions that you could use if you wanted to. Now, the last thing that we're going to talk about is assigning a type to a module variable. So imagine if we create a variable inside a module, which would be test player. And we want this variable to always be equal to a player. Well, the issue is you're not actually able to annotate on a table variable. Another example of this to make it even easier would be, let's just say test number. And of course it would be of the type number and we set it to 10. This will not work because you're not able to annotate on a table variable. One solution that developers have came up for this would be basically creating a fake variable. So we would say test number. We would then annotate that to the type that we want it to be. And we can then set it to the value as well. And now for the table variable, what we would do is we would actually just set it equal to that like fake variable that we created. So then if we said module dot test number, we can see that this is going to be a number because we set it to our local variable right here. And the same thing would happen if we say annotated it to being a player. We of course would have to initialize it to a player so that wouldn't exactly be possible right now. But then if we said test number, now module dot test number is being identified as a player. So once again, a slightly hacky solution, but it is a solution that developers have used. And I wanted to share it with you because this is a question that I had when I was learning about type checking. Anyways, ladies and gentlemen, that's going to be it for this episode. Hopefully it did help you guys out and hopefully you guys are going to start using type checking in your scripts. I also left two links down below in the description if you guys want more resources on learning about type checking. There's a great page on the official Louie U website and there is also a very nice developer forum post on this as well. Anyways, if you guys did enjoy the video or you learned something new, make sure you smash the like button, also the subscribe button and turn this post notifications on if you want to get notified when I upload more Roblox development content. Additionally, I have a Patreon if you guys like to support me and gain access to countless scripts and game files that I've made in my previous videos. There's a link down below in the description and you guys can go and check that out. With that being said, I'll see you guys in the next video.